Praise God for bringing us to this 8th uh, Triennial Conference of the Missionaries of Indian Evangelical Mission. I consider it a great privilege to be standing here on a pulpit that has been used by men of renown and people who have uh, known the word and studied the word much deeper and much longer than my experience and study. But I believe that this is a time which the Lord has ordained in his providence so we could come together these three days to meditate his word, to understand his mind and go and continue to work in his vineyard. I want to just say a few words uh, by way of introduction to get you acquainted with your speaker. When you know the background of the speaker a little bit, uh, it makes you understand uh, uh, why he says what he says and the application of whatever principles that he presents uh, become easier, more practical and relevant. I was born and brought up in a high Anglican tradition in a village called Nazareth, which is one of the southernmost towns of Tamil Nadu in the year 1947. And the Lord uh, saved me in the year 1962 when I was a first year college student in St. John's College, Palayangote. After which, I joined the Alahapa Chettiyar Engineering College in Karikudi for my engineering degree. Those days there were only six engineering colleges in the whole of Madras state and Alahapa Chettiyar College was one of them. I happened to join there because my daddy who retired early from Indian Army was working as a security officer in that uh, hostel and in the college campus. During those five years the Lord prepared me for a great ministry ahead though I was not very aware of it. It was a campus ministry. We, a couple of us, gathered together and prayed every evening for about an hour or two for our own personal sanctification and revival of our nation. We never thought that God was preparing us, that small team, for a great ministry ahead. After my graduation in the 1968, I joined the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras for my master's degree in foundation engineering. I completed it in 1970 and the Lord in his mercy and grace enabled me to pass with honors and that year I married um, my wife who was at that time doing her senior house surgency in the Christian Medical College Hospital in Velo after which uh, she did uh, uh, specialization in pediatrics. So that landed me in the CMC hospital to work there as a project engineer for the new uh, hospital buildings, especially the theater complex that were coming up. And so both of us started our life there after a brief time of teaching in the regional engineering college at Tichinapoli. So we were there for five years, but at the beginning of our career in the CMC hospital itself, the Lord led us to start a ministry called Blessing Youth Mission. It actually started as a campus ministry to work among young people and challenge them and equip them and send them to villages to reach the unreached for Jesus Christ. But during those five years, we were sending uh, these young people as teams to hills, uh, Jawadi Hills and then Koli Hills at that time, uh, the brand was alive. And we used to send our missionaries to Sitiri Hills and several places, who when they returned said that they would be happy to stay back in those places if only the mission would station them there. So what started as a campus ministry in just about five, six years time, grew up to a missionary organization. To cut the story short, today we have 290 full-time missionaries working in 11 states of India with the headquarters of this mission in Belo. That's where we started the work. My wife and I were coordinating the ministry from the central office from 1971 to 1987. After which we felt we ourselves should go and plant ourselves as part of the teams of our missionaries. So we left the administration in the hands of our next liners. So we moved to Karnataka to spend two years there and then to Orissa for three years and then to Maharashtra for two years and also some hill tribal areas for a year. And then we were in Madhya Pradesh, actually we were based in uh, Jabalpur, during which time when we were planning to have our next move to Rajasthan, I was suddenly diagnosed for a heart problem, so I had to be rushed back to CMC Hospital, where in 1996 I had a bypass surgery, after which um, our leaders uh, very much persuaded that we would not get back to face the field stress 
but stay back in Belur to uh, advise our missionaries and leaders in whatever capacity we can and continue our ministry of writing and itinerant preaching. So we are based in Belur now. Uh, according to our uh, mission rules, I am likely to be retired next year. But the Lord has given me a very rich ministry of studying His Word all these years. If I am given another life, I will continue to study His Word and share His message wherever I can. We are blessed with uh, just one child, a daughter. Her name is uh, Evangeline. Uh, she has accompanied me because my wife could not join me uh, as she is very tightly held up in a relief project she has taken up in the drought hit districts of Orissa. So she is up there also uh, helping in a mission hospital which is uh, very much understaffed, basically no doctor. So because she is very tightly held up there, uh, she couldn't go over here especially to uh, lead that stress management seminar. So my daughter who had her counseling training both in India and abroad in Christian counseling and crisis counseling. So she is now um, with us, so she will be taking that uh, seminar. So I want to really thank God for giving me this privilege of uh, facing and addressing missionaries because basically I am a missionary. Most of you uh, met me this morning and last evening to say how our literature has been a great blessing to you. And if you have ever seen our books, I always introduce myself as a missionary because I always believe the word missionary is synonymous to the word apostle and God has kept apostles first. Once upon a time we used to say he is only a missionary but now I will say he is a missionary. So that's the highest position that God has given for because we are the pioneer workers, we are the founder uh, ministers in God's uh, vineyard. We only blast the quarry and then other people, sculptors and all, they come later. So I want you to be encouraged this morning that you are not just missionaries but you are missionaries. You are apostles in the uh, wisdom of God and the plan of God who go and lay the foundation and other Apollos and others will follow to water the plant or uh, do some superstructure work. So I am so thrilled to stand before you. This is the first time I'm addressing a gathering of Indian Evangelical Mission. So I also bring greetings from the leaders and the fellow missionaries of Blessing Youth Mission. And as a missionary, I know your uh, heart aches and your longings and your frustrations, your puzzles because I have spent enough time in the office in administration and I have spent enough time in the field with the staff as one of the missionaries and now I continue to uh, help missionaries uh, in their work uh, both in cities and also in pioneering situations. So I believe that what we will be studying together and meditating do during these three days uh, will be down to earth practical and most of what I will be sharing with you uh, has been born out of my own uh, experience, uh, sometimes um, agonizing experience and sometimes uh, exciting experience. But what I have learned from God's word and from God's man, I will bring to you uh, this morning. Before we go to the message proper of this day, uh, shall we again bow heads before God for a word of prayer. All eyes closed and heads bowed down. Hearts lifted up to God because God wants to speak to us if only we are ready to listen to him. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your blessed presence. That is in our midst because we have gathered in the name of your dear Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh God, this morning as we have come under the umbrella of your Holy Spirit, we pray that your Holy Spirit shall take the truth home into our hearts. Help us, O oh God, to understand. Help us, O oh God, to appreciate. Help us, O oh God, to correct ourselves. Convict us, O oh God. And above all, O oh God, we need encouragement. Because we are all so tired and we are so worn out. And we have come here, O oh God, to retreat with you to be refreshed in your presence, to be renewed and to be recouped. So God, as we get back, we'll be able to do things much, much faster and we're able to do things much, much better than what we have been doing so far. Thank you for all of us who, have, who are here and we pray for those missionaries who, due to some reason or other, could not make it this morning. We pray, O oh God, that you send forth these blessings to them also. And we also pray for our friends uh, who had a difficult uh, a journey as they were coming down and as they are going to a difficult situation we pray that you would apply your bomb of Gilead upon them and we pray oh God that you also enable them to come out of the crisis and be here with us perhaps tomorrow we give you all glory and honor and we pray that the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth this morning should be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight for we ask this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior 
Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So praise God for the theme that is given to us for this um, conference. Approved unto God. Uh, we have that uh, in the epistle written by Paul to his uh, uh, probationary apostle or probationary trainee that was Timothy. Approved unto God. Now there are a few phrases which uh, come very often in these two epistles and one of them is in the sixth chapter of first epistle and verse 11. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. But you, O man of God, but you. Once again, but you. Come with me to the second epistle and look at the uh, third chapter and read verse 10. But you. Again, verse 14 of the same chapter. But as for you. And fourth chapter and fifth verse. But you. So what was Paul trying to uh, tell his, um, his young minister, his true son in faith? But you. I think uh, this particular phrase was uh, deliberately used. But you. Others can do it, but you cannot do it. Others can just do it and go scot-free, but you cannot do it. In other words, if you read carefully, afresh, these two epistles, Paul is trying to make this young minister of the gospel understand in practical terms the constant and the eternal conflict that's going on between these two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. The kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Constantly in collision. So he's trying to bring the young person's mind into focus to look at that and do everything with that in mind. But you. Others can, but you. In other words, Paul was training that young person, that missionary, whom he would entrust with lots of responsibilities about the ministry that he founded, upon whom perhaps the mantle of Paul would rest once this man would leave his earthly body for his eternal glory. He wanted him to know that Timothy, in your life situation and in your work spot, you will face situations where you will have to make very difficult and delicate choices. You will have to make a difference between not good and bad, but good and better. So it's going to be difficult for you unless you have your spiritual senses really sensitized and your spiritual discernment becomes very sharp, razor sharp spiritual mind. Now I believe this is where we all find ourselves today. Satan having known that he has got a very little time left before his final knockdown. He is doing all that is possible in a highly accelerated manner to destroy the minds of God's servants. Whatever words that I use this morning, by the grace of God, I have chosen them very deliberately. Follow the stress carefully. So he is trying to so much destroy and disturb our mind that we will make mistake in our choices. We are in a world of constant tension. I still remember a few years ago, we have a big swing in our garden. So I was just uh, sitting there and uh, some of the young boys and girls from our colony, they just joined me and they just sat on either side and they are just swinging with me, uh, telling some stories and playing with me. So one little girl, hardly five or six years, I just asked her, her name is Beulah, I said, Beulah, how are you? You know what her answer was? In her uh, colloquial Tamil, she said, Uncle, ore tension, Uncle. She said, Uncle, Tension. Now, I was literally shocked because I was introduced to the word tension for the first time when I entered the strength of materials laboratory class in the third year of my engineering where we studied tensile strength and compressive strength. So I thought about tension only relating to the strength of steel and concrete. Until then, the words 
tension was not in my vocabulary, regular vocabulary. But the child, hardly six years old, she answered me very politely, Uncle, just tension. Now I think that child gave the best truth ever told. I think that is very true of all of us here in the ministry. The Lord Jesus Christ was under constant tension. He had to make very difficult choices. His very close bosom friend would come to him and tell him, Master, Lord, this cannot happen to you. And Jesus would have to choose some words, very difficult words and say, Get thee behind me, friend. No! Get thee behind me, Satan. Very difficult. He had to make the choice. He had to bluntly and abruptly and totally and completely and mercilessly reject that suggestion. So he could come out of that tension, that battle victoriously. His own brothers and disciples on one occasion would come to him and say, Oh, you are so miraculous in all your powers and in your manifestation. Why don't you go to the festival when everybody is around there? There is a big gathering, a big crowd. If you want to really show your power to the world, go when there are people. But Jesus said, I am sorry. No, no, your time is always there. You go, but I would like to wait because I have not heard from my father yet. Very difficult choice. And there was a place where he had a very successful healing campaign. Sick were healed, or demons were cast out, people were blessed, there was a great rejoicing. And people would urge him, why don't you extend your campaign for a few more days? And Jesus said, no, I must go to the other towns also, for that only I am sent. So the Lord Jesus Christ, you find, had to make choices which were rather looking funny for the other people. Now I want to speak to you this morning, at least 10 or 12 areas where we are under constant tension. And I preach, speak to you not as a preacher or a Bible expositor, but as a missionary, as someone who has weathered a missionary life, who has just undergone what most of you are going through, if not at least trying to be with those who have really suffered. So I want you to listen to me with that kind of a sympathy and at the close of this message you will realize that you have been very personally ministered unto. You may not perhaps taste this sermon this morning but here is a message that will come very close to your heart. I would title my message this morning as Tensions of Today. So we will try to study at least 10 or 12 of them as time would permit. The first one is the tension between immediate and ultimate. Immediate or ultimate. Today or tomorrow. Instant or long standing. Now as we were driving down from Kwamitu to this uh, campus, on the way we saw a lot of coconut groves, coconut gardens. And everywhere I could read something hybrid varieties. Now we have uh, planted uh, five hybrid coconuts in our own um, compound. They started yielding in four or five years time. Good ones, big ones. But you know what happens? These hybrid stuff, they start yielding fruit very early and they stop also quite early. But that old ones, that old time natural coconuts which has got no hybrid stuff whatsoever absolutely nothing they start yielding fruit late and they keep yielding fruit almost for generations not the years hybrid varieties normally yield for 15 to 20 years maximum afterwards it starts tapering but the normal coconuts where man has not played with it except that he waters it and fertilizes it. They go for generations. We have in one of our mission stations, Siteri Hills, near Dharmapuri district, we have two coconuts planted by the original owner of that land, which has been yielding fruit for nearly 100 years, and it is still yielding. And other hybrid varieties are all around. Dear brothers and sisters, these are days where because we are given a pressure of targets 
where we come under all sorts of pressure which i will be touching upon in the course of this message we try to think of that which would give us instant immediate result not mindful of that which is ultimate instant satisfaction rather than ultimate glorification we have before us a very very sad example in isa i am hungry i am thirsty i am dying what is the use of my birthright give me some soup give me some stew if i am not alive i am going how am i going to inherit it all i want now is a little a bowl of soup so he was more concerned about the immediate than the ultimate and later on he wanted to get it back with tears of perhaps repentance but he could not get it back we all go through chastisement when you go through chastisement you know what is more painful it is not chastisement which is more painful how people around us look at our chastisement that is more painful how they criticize how they interpret it that's more painful that's more chastising than the chastisement itself but the bible says any chastisement for the present is painful is grievous but for those who are used and trained in it they would say welcome suffering welcome chastisement because they are so used to it they know there is going to be an ultimate fruit bearing immediate or ultimate that's why god said in psalm 37 any times you are downcast i would very much urge you friends to read and read it psalm 37 next to psalm 23 i have found psalm 37 very very meaningful in most of my life's difficult perplexing situations You know what God is trying to say on what you look today don't get perturbed wait a minute see what's going to happen tomorrow not now but then so when you are may you have to make choices between that which is immediate and ultimate friend keep your eyes on that which is ultimate the second tension that we normally go through is the struggle of the pull between deciding for quantity or quality quantity or quality size or sort what or how i hope you get the shade of it these are days when everybody says big is beautiful everything you start big because first impression is the best impression that's what people say friends this is something we have to unlearn from the world the kingdom principle is not at all like that the kingdom of god is not like a pumpkin but it is like a mustard seed start small grows big but the world wants to start big so that it's very impressive the churches throughout all judea and galilee and samaria had peace and were edified they were walking in the fear of the lord and in the comfort of the holy spirit this is qualitative growth edification comfort of the holy spirit fear of god etc etc and then it says and they were multiplied these days there is so much of talk on church growth but the moment we use the word church growth we think about numbers the quantity but here the emphasis is on quality and then quantity I always uh, use Luke's gospel second chapter you don't need to take that words 52 whenever I address young people You know how Jesus grew the boy Jesus grew in wisdom and stature not stature and wisdom I hope you understand that in quality and then in quantity when you sacrifice quality for quantity we get the spirit of babel what is the spirit of babel they had brick for natural stone 
and they had asphalt for mortar substitutes now with substitutes you can always build faster only when you want to have something natural and supernatural you have to go slow but with anything that is synthetic you can grow faster the basic problem of the babel tower was it was all synthetic that which was synthetic was smashed by the supernatural descent of god beware of imbibing that old babel and the future babylonian spirit which votes for quantity against quality that is why if you have read the laws and regulations in the old testament especially concerning the costumes the garments you know one of the interesting things what god has said maybe that is not very applicable to us today god said in deuteronomy 22nd chapter 11th verse don't wear a dress that is a mixture of wool and linen wool and cotton but that's comfortable for us and easy to maintain but those days god said don't combine don't mix up wool and cotton see wool represents the religion of abel that religion which is with blood which is an acceptable religion but cotton is the result of men's man's labor that was the religion of cain cotton can very easily expand multiply but wool it take time you have to wait so don't mix that up see all through the scriptures god has laid emphasis on this important truth that's why paul came so boldly and perhaps vehemently upon the preachers of his day i as a wise master builder i have laid a foundation another man builds their own let each man take heed how he builds not what he builds but how he builds because each man's work shall be manifest and it shall be found out for what sort it is s o t or t not what size it is because each man's work shall be tried by fire the fire shall test each man's work unless it stands he will lose his reward in other words what paul was trying to say it is not what you do but how you do that is important these are days all over the world let me say that without any apology all over the world the trend in christian ministries is that the end justifies the means the end justifies the means if people are blessed if there are lots of people gathering if everything works out successfully that means how we did it is approved by god no whether you speak to the mountain or hit the mountain water will gush out follow me carefully spiritual minds can understand what i am trying to say whether you speak to the mountain or hit the mountain water will gush out but when god wants you to speak to the mountain and if you hit the mountain and when water comes out and people are blessed you will still be punished because you have not done it as god has asked you to do it end does not justify the means blessings are not a guarantee that that ministry is blessed by god so friends it's not what you do but how you do that is important quality or quantity the third tension that you need to constantly keep in your mind is the struggle between that which is spiritual and scriptural spiritual or scriptural <laughs> immediately there may come a question whether what is the difference between them both are the same both are not the same all that is spiritual may not be scriptural but all that is scriptural is spiritual lot of things which have a spiritual flavor both within christianity and outside they are not scriptural god has not called us to be just spiritual but he called us to be scriptural it's not experience but it's the truth it's not subjective but the objective it's not just how i feel but what the word says the facts 
we all know about the story of how god punished the people when they were bringing the ark of god to the place where it should be there was such a great plague it was a big disaster a punishment if it had happened today that would made headlines in today's newspapers what was the problem did they not bring the ark upon a new cart it was a new cart they didn't give a second class treatment in bringing god's ark to its place but why did god get angry if you carefully study the narrative and the passages before bringing the ark of god on a new cart was a method learned by god's people from philistine it was a philistine method you know what was god's method what was god's prescription to bring the ark you should bring it up on your shoulders you should bring it up on your shoulders you may think that you improved on the system friends we cannot improve on what is written what is written is written and that's it there is an aim into it so you can't just add up anything to it say and say that it sounds more uh, spiritual no as god has said so later on when they changed the method to gods they were able to bring the ark to its place without any confusion that's why paul when writing to timothy look at the second chapter of second timothy second timothy second chapter and look at verse 5 so clearly and categorically apostle paul makes that statement if anyone competes in athletics he is not crowned unless underline the word unless i like that word unless please open your bibles and see the references this is only the first day don't grow tired you should grow tired only on the third day if at all you should <laughs> open your bibles and see the references for yourself and see whether things are so second timothy second chapter fifth verse if anyone competes in athletics he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules it's good to build a building i am a civil engineer but the first thing that i would uh, require of my masons and the mastery when they come to work is the plumb line and the spirit level sometimes they forget that they bring their uh, uh, towel and everything but they don't bring their uh, plumb line and uh, spirit level invariably i send them back and say go and bring it you cannot build a building because the verticality and horizontality of a building they are far more important than anything else that you do in a building that straight edge that is why the eyes of the lord look at the plumb line in the hands of zerubbabel with a delight if god wants to delight the work that you are doing maybe in a city in church ministries or in a town in promotional ministry or in a remote village in a pioneering ministry if god has to look at you zerubbabel with the delight the first thing you like to see is when you are working do you have the plumb line with you in your hand and are you using the plumb line the eyes of the lord behold the plumb line in the hands of zerubbabel with the delight whenever i read that passage my spirit dances with me and say lord give me this privilege of your eyes of delight turn towards me whatever i do the condition is very simple do what god says and obey what is written there are lots of uh, things going on in the spiritual world these days which are highly questionable people call it extra biblical experiences from god now i for one would not stand a minute to accept those things i am not obliged to accept a so called spiritual experience however exciting it might be if i am not able to find some biblical basis for it may not be direct but at least if not explicit at least some implicit reference to it i should say in the bible otherwise i would summarily reject it i am not interested in i am not obliged to accept it and god is not going to punish me it might be very very spiritual but i am not interested in it for me i have these bounds the scriptural bounds i would not like to go on the border on the boundary and as you travel across this country meeting with people various churches and fellowships groups you yourself will have sometimes difficulties 
in battling with what you have studied from the word and observing what you are seeing otherwise friends wait don't just be like Thessalonians too good accept everything but be like Bereans who receive but who research they not only hear the word but also do some homework see whether things are so so that they become more noble minded than the people who are in Thessalonica may the Lord give that grace to each and every one of us spiritual or scriptural fourthly power or purity the conflict between power and purity everywhere we hear about power conferences power conferences hallelujah thank God for it because too long we were uh, depending upon our institutional strength intellectual strength our influence in society so on and so forth so it's time we get back to God's power not depending upon our military strength or muscle power we need to depend upon the Lord because the task is mountainous and we have to depend on the spirit of the Lord says the Lord of hosts no doubt so everywhere we talk about power these days good but I'm yet to come across conferences which are known as purity conferences, holiness conferences. We have gifts of the spirit seminars, but what are the fruit of the spirit seminars? Every tree shall be known by its fruit, not by its gift. Those gifts are necessary. So you find that we Christians, we always swing like the pendulum from one extreme to the other extreme. Sometimes we deny all there is power and we go only after the letter. And the other times what we do, we go to the other extreme and then we miss one. I think we need to maintain a balance. It's not this or that, but it is both. We need power, but we need purity above all. He is called Holy Spirit. Holy. His primary function is not, he is not called power spirit. He is called Holy Spirit. The spirit of purity. He is the spirit of holiness. So, Holy Spirit. Maybe if you would let me a little bit of playing with the word. Holy Spirit. First purity and spirit. That is the power aspect of it. We need charisma. But there should be character. Charisma is necessary. But we need character. We need gifts. But we need fruits. Turn with me to Second Corinthians. There is a passage where both these are brought together under proper tension. 2 Corinthians 12th chapter, easy to remember, and 12th verse, 12 12. You know, the, this is where we talk about apostles. 12 means apostles, we talk about that, and 12 12, easy to remember. Truly, the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance. In other words, the power of an apostle was manifested with all perseverance, with all patience. So he talks about charisma, at the same time he talks about character. Are you mainly after efficiency or you want ethics? Shall I tell you something? Not as a critic. I may sound critical but I just mean to be analytical. We talk about efficiency but we sacrifice ethics. Ethics has become a very rare commodity in Christian ministries. I am not only talking about evangelistic ministries, but I am also talking about a missionary organization. Ethics. We are talking about hi-fi, but we have lost honesty. We are talking about being impressive, but we have lost integrity. We are talking about skill but we have forsaken sincerity. Friends in your fields or in your office, never ever sacrifice that character, that purity, that holiness. Without holiness it is only hollowness and hellishness. As uh, Brother Emil Jebusing sang in his Tamil song which he composed of years and years ago, let the word holiness be written in all directions, in all my boundaries. In Yelle Yangum Parsutam Yeldapadut. Let that be our watchword. 
the fifth tension that we need to tackle earthly or eternal earthly or eternal I want to put it differently physical or spiritual physical material or spiritual it comes to issues that is satisfaction or sacrifice We all know the text in 1 Corinthians 15th chapter and 19th verse. 1 Corinthians 15 and 19. If in this life only another translation says if for this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men the most miserable. If all our concern and consideration is for what we will get here the blessings the health and the wealth and all these goodies 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 the bible says we are of all men and the most miserable but we have before us our parents not our first parents but our faith parents adam was our first parent but abraham is our faith parent he left that which is of earthly attraction for that which is of eternal satisfaction reward he left the towers to live in tents archaeologists who tell us that during abraham's time in his house which happened to be two or three story building they even had water pipes for me for an engineer it's very unbelievable but they say that i read it somewhere think of a man like that he left towers living in towers to go and dwell in tents A jamindar just going to ask for a piece of land to bury the dead body of his beloved wife, and he's called the first missionary. He's called the first missionary. Everybody says Genesis 13 is the genesis of missions. Leave and go to a nation, to a land that I will show you. Now we all have left certain things. I want to tell you something. At the beginning of our missionary career, we will be more eternal minded than earthly minded. But as you keep sojourning, follow me carefully. As you keep going on in your missionary work, here and there you pick up some garbage. Here and there you pick up some stuff. So after 10 years or 15 years, shall I tell you, many missionaries after 10 or 15 years become more earthly minded than eternal minded. It happens. it happens because it's so attractive they start arguing with their minds ah, everybody is like that ah, that's what we will say that's what we said in the beginning but in course of time because we look at some poor models like demos who lead a missionary team off in the middle putting his eyes on the present world we would rather look at demos and diatrophies dear brothers and sisters this morning the word of the lord comes to us just look back 10 years ago when we joined the mission 15 years ago when you stepped out of your uh, professional career to become a full time missionary you said no i am not interested i am not i don't want these things no 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 you you want to take it you take it i am going to a city who, whose founder and builder is god but in course of time it has slowly shifted isn't it Isn't it? Is it? Is it not time that we take a stock of our lives? If this is not self-examination, what other self-examination are we going to subject ourselves to do, dear brothers and sisters, my fellow missionaries? Check whether you are earthly-minded or eternal-minded. As your soul prospers, let your body prosper, and let you prosper in other material blessings. Sixthly, there comes a conflict in our lives between God's will and God's work. It may be misleading. What is God's will and what is God's work? All that goes in the name of God's work may not be God's will, but all that is God's will is God's work. There are people who are casting out demons. There are people who are prophesying. There are people who are healing people. There are people who are doing this that 1 2 3 
But when they called unto him, Lord, Lord, he said, Not anyone, everyone who calls unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father. Because what they had done so far is his work. The secret of the successful ministry of Apostle Paul from beginning to end was that his life and ministry were punctuated with a question which began on the road to Damascus. Lord, what will you have me to do? You know, when we come to the end of our life, maybe 30 years in the mission field, retirement and then we lay off, and you know how our tomb should be epitaphed? David had the best epitaph. You know what it was? David did the will of God in his generation and slept. Amen? We need that. Not David did something great. David did the will of God in his generation and slept. 25 years he worked in a mission field and he translated the Mars gospel, etc., etc. That is too much. It will be very costly to epitope it on the granite stone. No. It's better he epitope it like this. He did the will of God in his generation and slept. Nothing more than that. Nothing more than that. I long for it. I ask the Lord to do it. When I come to my life's end, when I come to my ministry's end, I should be able to say, Lord, I have done your will. That's what Jesus said. Father, I have fulfilled your will on earth. Father, I have glorified your name. What else? He didn't say where he went. He actually left Nazareth for Nathalie. He went here, there, 101 things he did. He didn't list them out. But he said, I have done your will. So when you are pressed between these two choices, find out what God wants you to do. It's not job satisfaction, but it is Jesus satisfaction that is important. That's, that's what matters. Seventhly, it's a very, very crucial, difficult situation most of us find ourselves in. Fellowship or family. Fellowship or family. Ministry or family. Work or job or family. It's a very difficult question. Because the Bible says, again in First Timothy 3rd chapter 4th and 5th verses, it's a very, very important truth that we need to consider this morning. First Timothy 3, 4 and 5. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence, he is the one who is properly qualified to the work of an overseer or a leader in the church. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? I am sure that uh, you have got a uh, lot of expositions on this passage. This passage, what it actually says, if you have children whom you are not able to bring under your uh, subjection and rule, how are you going to rule the church of God? Now, I often used to think, if we have to literally take these words, at least more than 50% of pastors and preachers should resign their jobs and quit. Because it is generally pastors and preachers' children who go wayward and who are dropouts from school, this, that, lots of things. Is that what God is trying to say here? I think it's, uh, we need to understand it in a slightly different context. I would look at it like this. A man is not supposed to neglect his uh, family for a ministry. That's the basic truth that we need to have. It doesn't mean that if a person has got a problem in the family, that means he has to close down his uh, ministry doesn't say that at the same time we need to keep our priorities right now I have uh, recently understood uh, this concept with the triangle with the one arm at the bottom the base and the apex at the top so I would put God on the top of this apex of the triangle and on the left side I would put the family and on the right side, I'll put uh, the ministry, a job, or work. The so guard, family, and the ministry. Is family more important than ministry? No. Is ministry more important than family? No. Is family and his ministry both are equally important? Yes. Spend enough time for ministry? No neglect to spend time with the family. Spend enough time with the family? Not too much time. Just go to the ministry. 
a kind of a balancing don't go to guilt trips but keep one to challenge the other keep one to challenge the other when you have problem in the family then take it as a challenge and try to set it right and when there is something good happening in the ministry use it as an encouragement for your family life i think we are human beings we need to have this kind of a balance god first and then keep family and ministry on either side when you are able to take both together in a proper balance you'll be a very successful minister of god eighthly a plus of men or approval of god this is a constant struggle a plus of men or approval of god you know the lord jesus christ in john's gospel twice he referred to the truth we'll read both those verses 12th chapter john 12 verses 42 and 43 john 12 42 and 43 even among the rulers many believed on him but because of the pharisees they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue for they loved the praise of men more than the praises of god in other words they loved the applause of men more than the approval of god come with me to the 5th chapter in the earlier statement and verse 44 5 and 44 how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only god here it says only god in some translation it says from god only you see this is something which uh, is uh, very very common in the initial stage of our missionary career don't think i am criticizing you but i am just keeping you as one of you and i am talking in the initial stage of our missionary work we want to please god what others think about us we are least bothered we want to please god we want to give god the satisfaction god would should okay what we do and what we do what we speak at the end of the day but in course of time when we work in an organizational setup we turn to become very diplomatic because only then you can really survive and then thrive you need to be very diplomatic how you should talk to your station in charge how you should talk to your local coordinator how you should talk to your section leader how you should talk to your state man because each person's temperament you know accordingly you so somebody said we become so diplomatic we forget that we are all called not to be diplomats but prophets and then when we write to the office headquarters office how we should say right and when the general secretary visits how we should act we are well prepared best training yeah, we learn it from our seniors this is simply too common so in course of time i tell you unconsciously we imbibe that culture it's okay i mean that's not that's the only way i mean you can't otherwise manage where is god in this picture you are in an organization you are in iem but you are not a servant of iem you are a servant of jesus christ never ever forget it it is he who has called you it is he who has ordained you it is he who has appointed you for the ministry just to have an organizational setup and structure in a society like ours in which we live we have this this is secondary we need to please god for me to please god is more important than pleasing others what will happen you please every tom and dick and harry but you fail to please god what will you say when you be stand before the god of the heaven and earth on the day of reckoning and reward what will you say then you may sound very successful because of your clever speech and because of the way you are able to handle things in a diplomatic way but what will you say then when everything will be naked before the all seeing eyes of god on the day of reckoning on the day of judgment may the lord give us grace not to labor for the applause of men but work for the approval of god a workman 
a prudent god a workman not i service as men pleasers but doing everything from the heart as unto god so don't shift to compromise in course of time maintain your initial conviction that i will please god at any cost let come what may you may i may suffer some loss because i tell the truth i may suffer some loss because i refuse to compromise nevertheless i will speak the truth the ninth tension that we find ourselves in very often competition or cooperation competition or cooperation this is not only between uh, missions and churches it also between missionaries not of two different organization but missionaries of the same organization missionaries in two different fields how many such disputes you know uh, i had to find myself in to sort out and settle and uh, help our people to come out of it and the aftermath of such audio <laughs> sometimes the women folk are more responsible for such situations than men folk you know saul and david david had his great victory over goliath a women folk came out you know for what to greet to greet no to greet saul they didn't come out to greet david they came to greet saul you know what they said when they came to greet saul they said saul has killed his thousand but david is 10000 you know what they were trying to say so far you were able to kill only 1000 but with an associate like david you will be able to kill 10000 so they said oh you got a good lieutenant so they came to congratulate saul you will read the bible narrative but saul misunderstood it he misinterpreted it and he became outrageous and furious they gave me only thousands but for this junior they are given tens of thousands friends let me tell you it is not seniority but it is spirituality that is more important especially in the mission field sometimes you may be a 10 year 15 year experience in the mission field somebody who has come just 5 years ago or just 5 months ago he will be able to accomplish things much much better than you rejoice god has given me a good associate god has given indian evangelical mission another good stalwart here i am able to see a future leader but don't look at him ah here has come a threat for my position very common and you may not show it out you will try to smile but you will frown in your heart but smile in your face i can always read smile with a frown and then there is an envy then there is a jealousy you know what is one of the main problems in fields when there are more than two workers jealousy and you know who normally who start this our beloved sisters in christ we were don't be a cause of any such tension and even if there is some tension that comes between this but give your hand of cooperation i like that tamil proverb i don't know whether you know that tamil proverb i will say that proverb in tamil and then interpret it in english a very simple truth yaar kuttinal enna nel arsi anal podu you know there is no english equivalent for that but there is a translation it matters not who pounds the paddy provided it becomes rice we believe in the same lord of the harvest all the grains are going to be stored in the same barn we are not going to have different different sacks this is iem sack this is bom sack this is fmbb sack there will be no sacks there will be only barn hallelujah you don't believe in shouting hallelujah hallelujah i was wondering maybe hallelujah is forbidden here Huh? we had a singing session wonderful singing session and march on march on was very good everybody was holding a song book in his hand nobody was clapping but people were wondering how to clap hands when song books are given no problem next session when you come one person hold the song book other person put down the song book 
clap the hands. The next time, during the next stanza, you give the song to the other person and you sing. Okay? So you can sing. So it matters not who forms the body, provided he becomes rice. The same master. It goes to him. Paul plans, follows, waters, but God gives the increase or harvest. Who is Paul? You know, many times we stop with the first passage, but there is another passage that follows. Who is Paul? Turn with me to that passage and look at that very, very important truth. It's the truth of a great challenge and encouragement. Uh, it is First um, uh, Corinthians third chapter. First Corinthians third chapter. We know that uh, five, six verses and all. You know, who is Paul, etc., etc. But he also another Christian. From verse twenty-one, let no one glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or the life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. I don't know whether you have ever noticed a very important truth here. People don't belong to preachers. Preachers belong to people. Please understand it. That makes all the difference. People don't belong to preachers. Preachers belong to people. That's what Paul is trying to say here. But that is not what is understood in the Christendom today. In Christendom it is people belonging to preachers. That's why all competition. Preachers belong to people, Paul belongs to people, Apollos belongs to people, Cephas belongs to people, Pre preachers belong to people, people belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. You see, the order is like that. It is God, Christ, people, and then preachers. Preachers are on the lowest rung. But it is the other way about that. We have slightly shifted that, and all problems have come in. And you try to bring coordination, it never comes, because this concept, this theology hasn't come in. So please understand it. People to whom we serve, they don't belong to us. We belong to them. The moment we get that, then competition between two workers becomes almost impossible. I guarantee you. Tenthly, the tenth uh, tension that we need to handle, external versus internal. External versus internal. That which is without and that which is within. Outside or inside. In the days of Jesus, this was an age for the religion of external things. They would wash the tumblers outside, but inside they would not wash. They would whitewash the tombs, but inside dead men's bones. So Jesus used the example of these tumblers and tombs. And he said, you clean up the inside, so the outside may be clean also. Hypocrisy. as against honesty. Spend time, brothers and sisters, in your busy schedule in the mission station to sit quietly before God to self-examine yourselves. I have prepared a questionnaire, a self-examination question for missionaries, which may be distributed to you today or tomorrow. Keep that with you both there in your walk with God in your field situation. Don't be over-independent. You need to have your freedom in Christ enjoyed, but that doesn't mean that you should move into a spirit of independence which totally cuts you off. Leave me alone! That's the cry of the youth today. No. Eleventhly, the eleventh tension that we need to tackle, personal calling versus popular demand. Personal calling versus popular demand. Apostle Paul repeatedly said, we will not measure ourselves with ourselves and we will not go beyond our measure. Second Corinthians 10th chapter 12 to 18. Read it at your leisure time. We would not go into another region, but we will understand the measure of faith and grace that has been administered to us and we will work within that sphere. One of your associates, missionaries, would like to be going for some theological training to earn a degree because someone might say if you have a degree promotion may be easier you might not have that calling your personal calling will not be to go and earn another seminary degree but to have some more practical training in a actual on the job situation on the plow situation 
So the pressure is popular demand or your personal calling. Ever since I started my pulpit ministry, I have been asked to either come on the radio or in the TV. As an engineer, I believe in using all modern technology and media for radio and television. But I understood that God had not called me, at least until now, for that ministry. Because I have time only for what already has been committed to my trust. And I want to do it well. So I don't extend it beyond my borders. Almost every other day I get phone calls to say, Anand, you hear what sorts of messages come on the TV every morning. Why don't you please come on that? We will sponsor. Only answer. I personally feel that I am not called for it now. Because I have my hands already full. I don't want to stretch too thin beyond myself. I want to remain within my calling. I am not ready to go for a popular demand. You know how many evangelists have become pastors in South India? Just because the pastoral job is more stable and more enumerating. Do you know how many prophets have become evangelists? Because if you are a prophet, you will be hounded. But if you are an evangelist, you will be garlanded. So what will you decide upon? This is a constant struggle that you will need to face in the ministerial world. Twelfthly and lastly, the tension that you and I have to handle and then come out successfully. Ministerial pressure or private devotions? Ministerial pressures or private devotions? As the work increases, as you need to visit more and more villages, and a lot of deadline is set for your work, you know what is the usual casualty? A quiet time with God. Jesus was not like that. People were pressing him for healing and teaching and learning but Jesus withdrew into places of solitude to spend time alone with his father he heard that John was beheaded and that it was time for him to choose the disciples the twelve of them he withdrew himself for a whole night of prayer I recently came across a statement made by that great uh, evangelist of honor Dr. Billy Graham in one of his writings someone asked him what will you do if you are given another life 60 years, 70 years. You know what he said? I have drawn a great challenge and inspiration from that saying. I will preach less and study more. I will preach less and study more. In your busy schedule, in your mission fails, never ever sacrifice or crowd out your quiet time with God. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your presence in which we could learn some of the truths that we need to keep constant in our minds so we can come out successfully from these tensions between immediate and ultimate, between quantity and quality, spiritual and scriptural, power or purity, earthly or eternal your work or your will, fellowship or family, applause of men or approval of God, competition or cooperation, external or internal, personal calling or popular demand, ministerial pressure or private devotions. Thank you Lord for the enlightenment and the encouragement and the conviction the clarity that you received this morning. Help us, O oh God, to decide for what your Bible and your word stands for. We give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.